Hi, this is Jason with Outcast Haven. Today I have with me Jacob Pearson, fresh off his calling victory in top eight at the Red Riot Games Classic Constructed Tournament. That's correct. So you, so I did, I, I talked to Jordan the last one I talked to with Jordan. He didn't have a, he didn't have a webcam and he came on on his phone and he's like, oh damn, I can see you. This is awesome. It, was, it just cracked me up that, you know, just everything, his whole demeanor is exactly what I expected. It was awesome. He's super funny. So that just cracked me up. What was your first TCG that you started playing? Uh, my first TCG, well, it depends, depends if you encounter or not, but when I was about three or four years old, <laughs> um, my sisters used to play netball down at um, the, the local netball courts, and I'd always find these like fake Yu-Gi-Oh cards lying around on the on these netball courts. What, what, so, is, what is netball? Uh, netball is like uh, a version, it's, it's like kind of similar to basketball, Okay. Um, except there's like no layups and you know not allowed to bounce the ball at all so it's all passing okay is that where there's no backboard yes and there's no backboard. okay i've seen yeah, that yeah. all right all right interesting yeah so i used to go around and hoard all these fake yu yo cards that i find like lying around on these netball courts because like right next to a school like a primary school yep and I'd just I'd just go around and then i'd um click them all and then i'd just be like to my parents oh what's what's like four thousand plus like five thousand because this one's this one says like four and three zeros this one says like five and three zeros and like, what does that mean right and i and then I, I used to make up my own games with them and that sort of thing um but my first like quote-unquote actual trading card game because i i grew up in a very rural area like out, outside the city in the middle of nowhere yeah, that's how um, i yeah, grew up I, same way yeah. we raised animals in the middle of nowhere so yeah. yeah uh very much the same thing so i i didn't really play video games or anything until i was a teenager uh i got invited around to some friends friends house who actually had a games console whoa mind-blowing <laughs> um but one time i went to a i think it was like a like probably similar to what like a county fair is for you guys yep um, um and there was like one guy uh who had this this little like game stand um, they sold Magic the Gathering cards, so I uh, I bought a starter deck, and then I used to just and then I bought another one, and I used to sit there and then just play against myself at home <laughs> <laughs> constantly, and that, that's how I got into it. And then I, I started playing competitively when I went to uh, university and a, and a bit in high school and uh, that, that kind of thing. But um, I played a lot of different TCGs, man. I think I'm I'm probably up in the in the twenties for the the number of like trading card games I have played, and probably like five or six somewhat competitively. Okay. Um, like Elder Scrolls Legends, the um, ESO TCG, uh, Hearthstone. Uh, I, was, yep. I was I was pretty good at that. Uh, card Fight Vanguard, uh, Buddy Fight, um, Weiss. Um, what else? I think, that, I think that's, that's all the big ones I played, like mostly competitively. Yeah. Flesh and blood aside, what has been your personal favorite card game? Elder Scrolls Legends, even though it's not a real card game, it's online only. Right. Um, but they 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 pulled a lot of really solid lessons from a lot of the other like card games that came out at the same time. So it came out around the same time as like Hearthstone. Um, they pulled some of the better ideas that I thought of. Uh, that well, I thought they were the better ideas from from Magic, and they and they kind of incorporate it into this, um, like resource system where you get like a resource generated every turn, like Hearthstone, but you have like uh creature combat similar to Magic, except you have two lanes, um, that that all your um permanents and all your creatures and all your resources get put into, and you're kind of playing a um management management style game with the, with those resources okay. so it's like you're playing two different game states at the same time which is really interesting interesting so at 20 games did you ever get into the any of the fantasy flight games like any of the lcgs or like destiny or any of those type of games or did you stick with the ccgs uh i tried to get into them but my problem was finding like a play group they're not very popular um okay. here in like New Zealand or Australia. Um, so anytime I, I had any kind of family interest in those kinds of games, it was very, very difficult to find any sort of play group or anything for them. Yeah, I think that's the, the typical card game dilemma is you find a great game, yeah. and if you don't have a group to play with, you can't 
really play the game. So that 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 stands true all over the world. So with Flesh and Blood, were you at Card Merchant when this game first came out? Were you working at Card Merchant? Oh, actually, um, I used to be a network engineer. Okay. <laughs> That's a little bit um, of a change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A little bit of an interesting, uh, a little bit of an interesting change in occupation. But um, I was actually going into some of my magic collection one day, a couple of months after the game first came out. Um, I think this would have been in like mid mid January, okay. uh, twenty twenty, and I rolled in with with all my magic cards and old Matty Rogers. I, I've known Matt roger since i was probably like eight or nine years old okay um and she's oh mate you love this game you'd be great at it you should give it a go there's like this this like 10k tournament thing happening like two weeks from now you know if you start playing now you could like maybe do somewhat okay and at the time i i was i was taking a break from work i i just had some time off i was on vacation so he's like yeah you know what i'm just gonna drop like two or three hundred hours into this and see what happens so uh, i knuckled (laughs) down played every event i could Hassled everyone, um, went over to a lot of people's houses to, to try and jam as many games as I could. I actually managed to top eight that calling, um, like two weeks, up, no, three weeks after I started playing, which was pretty crazy because I was terrible. Like, I was really bad for the first two and a half weeks, man. I'm talking, I'm getting like 40 0 by Cal McCraith and yep. the Guardian River. Like, it was, it was not a, not a good thing to watch, but um, something just, just clicked you know, like a day or two before that, that big tournament. And, yeah, well, just put up a decent result. And we have something in common. My first tournament that I did was on TTS, put on by Card Merchant when you guys were in lockdown. And I got Kale and Amir in like round two. And yeah. he, it was, it, this was a uh, blitz tournament and he 23 owed me. So he actually had more life than he started with when he beat me. So, yeah. and, th- and that was yeah. one of those things like when you're playing with your buddies here in the States and the three of us, four of us that started. I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm not bad. No, nope, I was absolutely horrible. <laughs> the, the, the thing is, you don't really realize the, the kind of depth that the game has until you you really have that, that spot where you're put into a situation with someone with a lot of experience. And then you're like, oh, wow, okay, there, there's, there's got to be some things I'm doing wrong here. I, I think that's an interesting part of this game versus like, I play Force of Will just because my son plays it with me he's 16 so the fact that we can go and do tournaments together is amazing but like magic the gathering to force the will you can pick up all the things pretty quickly whereas this game does not relate to any games there's no similar mechanics for the most part it's just yeah it's just different yeah it's, it's just it's just different on an intuitive level um some 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 previous experience with card games can help just with the, the kind of mental math going on yep. um and the back of some of your turns. But yeah, you're right. The actual mechanics of the game and how how the turns function and how everything actually plays out is very much fundamentally different than every other card game. Which means it really rewards you for sinking that time in because there's no real way to to get that that click right. without just playing a lot and just just trying to figure out what you were doing wrong or trying different things and all these little little bits of information just add up and they just just build up into this uh i guess muscle memory or mental muscle memory in your head where you're like okay i've been here before like this this means this this means this this means this and just becomes like one whole cohesive thing which i think is really awesome i've never experienced that that sense of like reward even from losing in any other card game normally if i'm if i'm sat down playing a card game and i'm getting smacked around like 40 yards it does not feel good but uh, with fab i always felt like okay like i need to figure out what i'm doing wrong and, and then that that sense of reward when you actually figure it out and you start doing it right it just feels amazing yeah, I, I will say I smiled the whole time that I got 23 old by Kale, and I ended up meeting uh, uh, Toby and Harry from Australia, and we still play with them a lot, and we've learned a lot from them. So, yeah, it was, you're right. You, it does. It keeps you intrigued. And you're like, okay, how did somebody with the same deck just destroy me so badly? And I ended up talking to Kale for – the next 15 minutes after that and he's just giving me pointers and like this is this and i was an aggro player so bravo was not the best first deck for an aggro player because i tried to play him like that and it just yeah. doesn't work yeah just, just just doesn't come together yeah no and it, it's funny because uh like we were talking um after this past tournament uh for red riot games and and i don't i had gone on to gem software and i looked at my pairings and i was actually paired against you for round one 
and then they repaired us. And I actually wanted to play you just because I was guardian. I figured you were guardian. I'm like, well, I'm going to learn something. And I really wanted to play you just because I wanted to have, I want to have the best. Honestly, that's, that, that's where I'm at. I, to be the best, you got to play the best. And then you eventually have to beat the best. So I wanted to play you and we got repaired and I was frustrated because I drawn my first two games and that's where you had said five to 10 seconds. And yeah. that, that's your thoughts. So I want to hear a little bit about that of in these big tournaments, your, your timing for each interaction. Yeah, sure. So with, especially with TTS, it's, it's a lot more apparent on this platform. Um, but every single thing you do is, is on a timer, right? Like we we're playing with standard round timers. So one round is 50 minutes. Um, and a lot of the, the, the physical actions of, of drawing cards and selecting things at random and rolling dice and making tokens, all that kind of stuff takes extra time. So yes, there, there is, is, um, a bit of players who are unfamiliar with PTS and that does cause some, some slow play as well, but a lot of it you can do by minimizing the time you're spending yourself. Um, thinking about exactly how you're doing your turn when you make your first block, your first block on your on your opponent's turn should decide the entirety of what happens that means you shouldn't think that means everything that should be should be booked out and you shouldn't be really trying to second guess yourself there that means like if you watch me play on stream i have two seismic surge tokens that i already have pre-made and then i'm flipping one up and I'm moving one to the side and then when i make another one i'm flipping it up and then i can just flip it and then move it and i'm also um if your opponent's okay with it as well, something that I often do is um, when they're doing end of turn procedure. So when like when they're moving the the cards from the the combat chain into their graveyard, yep. I'll often just like flip their pitch, move the deck on top of it, and place it back. It's all those things, like you said, they add like three, four, five seconds. And if you're having a, a game that over forty turns, those five seconds a turn add up into three or four extra minutes. Um, and three or four extra minutes is a couple of extra turns, which can make all the difference, especially with the new rulings, with the um, draws being uh, end of turn only, um, not turn zero, one, two, three. Um, those those three extra turns can make the difference between you managing to to, to take it out, um, or you both just just end up being too fatigued. You know, it's fallen over. It's a draw. No one can kill each other. It, it's funny because you bring up two good points there. One is this is in constructed going from blitz to finally step back and i play kano and blitz so it's i feel like i'm always under pressure like i have to put i have to attack i have to have certain cards i have to stack i have to do everything perfect we're bravo any game you don't want to make mistakes but i did map out my turns more so i knew what i was going to block with and knew i'm keeping these two cards no matter what or i'll pitch down to one and swing my hammer for four but Yes, there was that map out, especially playing Ninja, knowing that the combo pieces are coming in. I know roughly that they're going to be a four to five block. So, yeah, that was in this constructed tournament. It's funny you say that because it's the first time I kind of had that realization that, yeah, these turns have to be mapped out pre-made, just like you said. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's actually one thing that playing Bravo can teach you as well. Um, that's what's why I, I'm I got a poster of Bravo in, in, in the corner <laughs> of my room. Uh, just just to always remember the lesson because it, it really teaches you patience out of more the more so than any other class because everything your your turns are so quote unquote cookie cutter, right? Right. Like you, you're doing X thing or Y thing, but the idea is is you have basically three set things that you'll do on your turn no matter like basically depending on what your opponent does. So that means that you're picking A, B, or C based on what your opponent's doing. And that is something that um, you can use to set up big attacks for later in the game as well. Like often you'll just end up with like a crippling crush and a blue in hand. Yep. And you ended up blocking with two cards to shut down your opponent's like start of combo or something like that. And if you've done that so many times, you actually have this, this thing where you have a, a stack of um, turns that are set up for the bottom of your deck. And then when you transition into that, you can use your equipment to block and then do that. Or you can just play a straight uh like cooking out if your opponent keeps putting on the pressure you keep blocking six and blocking nine and you just hammer them back and it teaches you to be very patient with bravo because if you if you're sat there like i'm not doing anything like, I, i'm just i'm just bleeding damage i'm just falling behind um and you sort of get into that mentality then you'll just end up taking that one big hit try to come back maybe they'll shut you down with a defense reaction or something like that and then suddenly you're even further behind um, so, so being patient is, is something that that Bravo teaches you really well, and it really punishes the opposite. I think one um, good example of that, that, if you're interested, you can probably go back and watch the stream, 
Um, but back in my initial pod, I was versing Dante, I think, in the fourth round. Um, I was behind for about 10, 15 life most of that game. Um, but I was being very patient and waiting for my, my CNCs um, set in Arsenal, waiting for the, the turns where I drew my two pummels. So I was blocking four cards a turn, wow. just waiting for that to come up. And then I'd go CNC, pummel, pummel. And then I'd wait until I drew the next CNC, Arsenal it. And I'd do the same thing, just go, 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 go. And then it got to the point where after I played the second CNC, I set up a really big Tome of Fiendel turn from Arsenal, set up the Crippling Crush, got that off. And that momentum allowed me to, to swing back into the game, even with that big of a deficit. That, that's what I noticed. This was probably the most patient. I, that, that probably was the most frustrating for me was I played more patient than I ever have with Bravo. And when I played the Ninja player, it was another Minnesota person. So it was somebody in my own state that I played with in person. And I was super, super, super patient. And then I set up my huge crippling crush emerging dominance turns where I just swing momentum. And in my second draw, I played Dorinthia, and I did the same thing. I just block, 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 set up a huge turn when I got them emptied out of their arsenal. And, you know, you get 10, 15 damage put through, they empty hand, and then the pressure was on, and then time was called. And I was like, I did everything right, and it got frustrating. So it was nice to talk to you afterwards and be like, yeah, that's something that I'll have to consider, especially with Bravo, is I need to make those decisions immediately. Yeah. Because you know what you know what they're gonna do. You know what your deck is. If you have four yeah. blue cards, you, it, they do what they do. That's it. There's no thinking about it. They're three blocks. If you got a blue pummel, whatever, but just block out and move on. Yeah. Yeah, one hundred percent. Yep. So, oh, there we go. Sorry, your camera froze for a second, but it came back on. So, going back to uh, the calling for Blitz, you ran mm -hmm. the table with Ira. Yeah. How like? Number one, how fatigued when you get into the finals? How fatigued were you at that point in the finals? Um, in the finals, I think I I played what was it uh, nine rounds, about fifteen rounds, <laughs> just just the previous to, the, to that match where I had to win two two in a row. Uh, I was basically brain dead. Like I think my my jaw was open and I was almost drooling. Like my my brain was not switched on at all. Um, especially because all the, the top eight matches that I played were all Ira Mirrors. Um, and Ira Mirrors is probably the one where I have to think the most out That's of so any match. <laughs> um, and I think I only played against three non Ira decks in the entirety of the day. So by this point, my, my brain was, was in high and fry. So for, what, for, what was I'm your, gonna... what was your Swiss record? Uh, I ended up, uh, X. And two, I believe I lost a Ira Mirror to Matt, and I also lost to a uh, Kano player as well. Okay. Did you, was Kano OTK? Uh, yeah, Kano, Kano OTK. Okay. Yeah. Because I think that as a Kano player, I think that's one of the only effective ways to beat Ira is just to stay alive long enough to get to cycle around mm -hmm. to that. Uh, it was also a bit of a mistake I made with sideboarding as well. I opted to go for an Elrun 4 package. Um, okay. Normally against a OTK style Kano, I'll play the Snapdragon Scalers. Yep. Um, and I'll just decide to play a very heavy pressure game. Uh, but uh, I didn't have the information beforehand. And uh, <laughs> yeah, just, just just ran into it. And then I got halfway through the game. And I'm like, well, I know how this one's ended. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, I mean, the Snapdragons is what makes it really, it's really weird because you guys do the calling out there. You have six Iras out of eight. Now all these skirmishes are popping up. I don't know how all these guys are doing all of these because as a person with a wife and a kid, I can only manage one, one every two weeks. So I'm like, geez, these guys are in every day. They're grinding these, which is amazing. I wish I could, but so now you're starting to see a North America meta that is looking a lot different actually than New Zealand's meta. If I, I believe were warriors running, crazy right now is yeah. it different than what you guys are seeing or i mean i'm not trying to offend anybody is are, are the americans not playing ira right is it they found a new warrior version what's happening here that you can see from what you've you've watched yeah sure so actually there's been a really big surge of warrior players uh, the, the skirmish that i played in new zealand recently ish uh i flew down to the, the south island fort and down nelson um Top four players were all Dorinthia players, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, the the I guess the the shift you, you might call it is is partly due to um, go tall warrior with like the multiple red overpowers, yep. the multiple 
red routes is very strong against the more traditional kind of IRD that I was playing at the calling. We were only playing the six defense reactions, only playing the flick flacks. That way, because we're, we're blocking on the single attack, and then they, they just get to go really high. They, they often don't even, don't even care about getting the second hit in with Dawnblade. Right. They're just about getting very, very, very high on that initial attack. And because Ira wants to, to block with two cards and attack with two cards on most turns, it, it really disincentivizes that strategy. Um, because you end up either not being able to put any pressure back because you're having to dump your whole hand constantly um, in fear of them going over the top, or you call their bluff and then you, you get, get smashed. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, see, that, that's like my Kano strategy against Warrior. I'm like, well, I'm just not going to block, and <laughs> either you kill me for 15 or I try to win. <laughs> that, yeah. that, 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 that's it. That's what we're down it's to. Very- Strategy. Um, it's, it's something as well that not a lot of people pick up on going against the really go to warriors. It's often a lot better not to block at all. And ta- even if you can't utilize your whole hand, um, if, you're, if your hand isn't very reactive at blocking, you'll often end up in spots where they're just going to get better of you when you, when you, when you go in with um, blocks there. Right. Or another good trick is forcing their attack reaction, their reprise attack reaction with equipment. So you can send them like three equipment on their Dawn Blade. Uh, get them to, to to play their reactions from hand, and then you send them your uh, defense reaction from hand or whatnot, just to, to try and minimize that damage. Right. Yeah. I and I've joked about it when people ask how do you block warrior, I just say you don't. I mean, that, that's <laughs> that's the best strategy. It's either I block with zero or I block twelve. That I, there's not really an in between. <laughs> Uh, which is why I, I really like Bravo. Um, I, I knew Dash Control was going to be a bit of a thing um, coming into the Classic Constructed. Yep. But uh, I decided, you know what? I'm just going to play what I enjoy. I, I'm a Bravo man through and through. And you know, I haven't played uh, Classic Constructed in, in quite some time. I was like, oh, I'll go, go back to my roots and just swing that hammer one more time. Um, which is, is, a, is a very good call against a, a warrior or a heavy meta, uh, I feel. Uh, a, a lot of the the warrior bravo matchup is very skill dependent. It's very much about reading what your opponent has and how much tempo you can claw back. Right. Uh, and you can often grind the warrior out, especially if they're on the less uh, attack action heavy builds. The, the builds that aren't running the enlightened strikes, the builds that aren't running the commands and stuff like that. Uh, it's very 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 easy just to to run them out of cards because your weapon attacks for four. There's right. only attacks for three. Yeah. So you can quite easily just in three cards coming for four um and they're just taking chip damage or they're just getting whacked down it, it's funny you say that so i played a a newer player he was admittedly a newer player and uh he started with 71 cards against me and when it got to time i had just bled him out of cards i think it was like 27 13 and yeah. he had no hand times called i'm gonna have a full hand and he just fell below less cards than me, starting with 10 cards more. So it's, yeah, I can see that. But once again, I was, and here's another mistake. I did help a little bit along the way, just as a newer, he was a newer player. I got the draw round one, so I already knew my day was over, getting a first round draw. So I tried to help out a little bit because I think that's how we grow the game as well, as helping players, especially at that point when I know I'm finished getting the first draw of round one. So... It, it was it was fine, but yeah, it I can see that because I play Blake, who you know part of our team here in Minnesota, and he plays Warrior, and it's a challenge every time, and he still usually gets me, and I'm getting better just because now I just go to that block heavy phase and set up those small little swings and and try to bleed out. But yeah, it skill skill dependent is a huge thing in that matchup. Yeah, it really is. The I my favorite games of all time is when I play Matt and I'm on Bravo and he's on Frontier. And that, that is the most enjoyable time I ever have playing Fab. Okay. Um, the, the mind games that, that go on in, in the background, the the readings, the the, the banter is all is all quite enjoyable. So yeah, that that that's funny because the last time we were playing Blake, I was playing Blake that we did. I'm like Blake, you're in my head right now because I'm just like, how oh, damn it, what do I? it gets like that which yes it's more fun it's just like when we play ultimate pit fight which you should come on and do with us sometime it's amazing because i love that because just because of the trash talk and the table talk it's making alliances screwing the person you just made an alliance with attacking somebody i love that it's one of the first games and blake has said this and we've said this dane as, as a team is it has multiple formats that we enjoy all the formats yeah. Like a lot of games when they have these multiple formats, I'm like, 
I'll do standard and you can do whatever else you want with the rest because they'll suck. But these, yeah. all the formats are pretty amazing in my opinion. Yeah, they, they definitely all have their, their niches um, that they're, they're really, really good for. Like Blitz is a very, very good format to introduce players. I'm very happy that they um, have kind of made Blitz the tournament format because it's the most inclusive and, and easiest to pick up. There's no sideboarding you need to think about. Um, the, the strategies are a little bit more linear, um, so you, you don't have to really worry about your opponent uh, changing their strategies on you like like midway throughout the game, that kind of thing. Um, and the pace of play is very fast, so games will normally right. get done in about 20 minutes or so, uh, which feels a lot better than some of the, the grind fests that can happen in Classic Constructed. Um, and obviously Classic Constructed is more like your 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 veteran format, if you will, <laughs> where uh, you're, you're playing these like really long-term strategies, like thinking about the, your pitch order, thinking about all the resources left in your opponent's deck, what are they going to hit me with next, that kind of thing, and then just adding those extra layers in. Right. Um, so yeah. I, I really like what they've done with the, the divisions between the formats. I, it's funny you say that because with, with Blitz, as a wizard player, I'm always on edge from the very first time I pick up my first hand because I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what I'm going to get. Am I going to absolutely brick? And then I have this puzzle of how do I get out of a bricked hand? If I draw four yeah. red, what, what the hell do I do? And with Bravo and Classic Instructed, honestly, going into every game, I was super relaxed. I'm like, I'm just going to block... I'm going to block until they get pissed off that I keep blocking. And I'm just going to swing these huge 18, 19 swings. You know, I even pulled off a towering Titan. Cause I'm like, I got four cards. They're all blue. And I got a towering Titan. I'm taking this turn off. Cause I'm just going to see what I can do. Yeah, yeah exactly. So it's fun. So the meta, I want to go back to meta. Cause yeah, first time in this game, I really feel like it's wide open. Like yeah. It's now that it's worldwide, you have so many more brains doing different things. And it's got to be difficult with all you guys in one central Auckland. You can kind of get stuck in a rut of a circular rut of tacking against your local meta, right? You, you start to do that. And then once it gets bigger and bigger and the more and more people you get in, the less tech you do for a local meta because the meta is ever changing. Yeah. So, yeah. Everybody bitched after the calling that Ira needed it needed to be down. Everybody saying stuff, and I don't know if you were the one of the ones, but there was plenty of people that said that uh, that the meta is undiscovered, which I think we now know it's still probably undiscovered at this point. Uh, would you agree yeah. with that? Yeah, one one thousand percent. I've always been a big believer that um, Ira isn't the be all end all. It was it was a decision I made based on the players that I knew would be playing which decks, yep. not because I believed to be the best deck in the format um by by far that that, that, was, that was my my opinion going into the calling i still don't think that was the the best deck that anyone could have played on that day um knowing especially knowing what the format is um but it's also something that i felt really comfortable playing with over a, a large amount of rounds uh it's a, it's a very intuitive deck for me to play uh i'm not sure why that is uh <laughs> it's just uh, it's like bravo and um ira midrange are just two of the most intuitive decks for me that i, I find it very easy to make snap decisions and for those set decisions to be usually correct, um, which over the course of like a 16, 17 round event is is massive. Um, just so playing something that you're comfortable with can often trump playing something that maybe is like one or two, three percent um, better in your perceived meta. And also what you're talking about with the um, kind of like the circular the meta in, in one region, that that's very much true because a lot of the, especially in this game, where a lot of the best players are known for playing certain decks or playing certain play styles, you often end up taking not against decks per se, but against players exactly. because you know that they'll be opting to play those kind of strategies and those are the players that you're worried about. So those are the players that you'll be um, playing against, which is I think also ties into that whole um, the, 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 the circularity of it all. Yeah, it, it's, it is crazy because I feel like right now, and I, I just want to get more skirmishes just because I feel like Kano's really undervaluated in the skirmishes in America right now. One, I've only played in one and I just bombed. I was three and one and then bombed out. I was really pissed off at myself. Uh, I got scared against a warrior player. I had the hand to get within one and I had to guess on the top card and I didn't want to do it. I should have just done it because it's Kano. You have to do that. You just go. So I, I, I think that knocking Ira down brings Kano way back up and there's just nobody, there's only a couple guys running him right now. So I yeah. think that's going to help, which just shakes up the meta completely again. 
And I don't know if you've played Reinar Claw. Have you experienced yes. against that? One of my all-time favorite decks um, for playing casually because I hate variants in competitive formats. You like, go along I, with I Dane. Despise variants, which means <laughs> I'm going to take Brute to a competitive event. But um, the, the deck is very, very good. Um, all honesty, that would have been the... If I was comfortable with playing Brute at that tournament, I would have picked that deck. Um, that was a deck that came up a lot in our testing, and we thought it had very good matchups against both Ira and Kano, which were the two decks we were worried about at the time. Um, and I think that has a, definitely has a lot of potential. Um, that's probably the deck uh, that I'm, I'm scared of most, to be honest. And, okay, which uh, is and which is amazing because I think now as we, it just now that you're finally getting all this time to tech and all these di getting more input because it was kind of unfair for you guys had zero input. So the rest of the world had all of your input to start so we kind of cheat we can start grabbing from there and tweaking from that input that we saw where you guys had nothing so you're going off your own and now you guys have meta to to come back to what you've been playing with now which is making it so diverse which to me just makes this game even more amazing i was looking at the last skirmish event tops and they had a kasai two dorinthias and a Reinar. That was just yeah. dominated by Ira before that, dominated by Kano before that. It's just amazing. Yeah, yeah, you just see these big, big meta shifts constantly, and um, it's very, very cool. Um, especially with the Monarch coming up as well, we'll probably see that even go even spikier oh. um, and go even even crazier with uh, the the swings and back and forth as people figure out these little niches. Because there's not a lot of metadata. For flesh and blood right like you look at a game like magic the gathering or um, any of the other big tcgs and there's so much metadata for all the tournaments it's very easy to pick trends right and, and it's almost like a stock market where you see like oh, okay this is this is going up so this is going to affect this and this is going to affect this yep. and, and, and pick and choose your your decks like that but because the, the game is so new and there's, and there's no real background data for the information that we're receiving, the inputs that we're receiving, um, it means that it's, it's constantly, uh, the volatility through the roof, right? Which is amazing. And I, I don't yeah. think in this, before Monarch comes out, Constructed will, will have never been discovered fully. Not even close, I don't think. Not even close, yeah. It, it just, to see, it was cool that Matt went off of his good dash builds um, and went with Dorinthia and it just shows that other people brought that deck and it's not an autopilot. You have to pile it properly, just like you pilot anything else and that there is tons of other stuff. I think Dorinthia is super strong, but I I'm sure any of the decks could have won. I was shocked to see that ninja had fallen. Cause there was tons of ninjas in our pod. Cause we were in the same yeah. pod. There was a ton of ninjas. There in was there. Three ninjas, I think. Yeah. 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 Which shocked me to have that. I, I, I knew there's going to be a lot of Dorinthias and I thought everybody would just grab Matt Rogers deck because there was not much else out there for classic constructed. And I figured a yeah. lot of people would just grab his deck and run with it. Um, yeah. I mean, I did play against a lot of dash control. I think I played against, yeah, like three, three ninja, four dash control decks um, over, the, over the, the, the CC rounds that I played. Okay. Which is very dangerous for me playing Bravo because I can tell you that matchup is not good. It, it, it's very, very, very bad. The, um, the dash, like, the dash one. Yeah, right? dash control versus Bravo is very bad for Bravo. Um, and, and testing when I was playing against Matt, I couldn't take one game out of twenty. Um, and and that matchup, it was, it was absurdly rough. Um. <laughs> Yeah, that reminds yeah. me of playing uh, Kano Blitz into Dash Aggro. It took me eight times before I could finally beat it because I'm like, I don't have enough cards to block all this. Like, what do I do? And you never get a chance to do anything. It's unless you can top deck an OTK right off the bat and string something huge together, you just die. Yeah, it, it, it's very much like that in, in that particular matchup. Although I've, I've come up with a couple of solutions since then, which have made it a little bit better, uh, but it's still not great. <laughs> but the Command and Conquers with your pummels definitely make, that upticks your percentage quite a bit into that matchup, correct? Yeah, um, but it's the matchup basically entirely becomes about pummel and CNC. That's all your deck is. That, okay. that you're, you're a one-trick pony. <laughs> uh, which, which people would say Bravo is normally a one-trick pony, but come on, better than that. But also... Um, it just means that every your plays are very what's what's the, what's the word I'm looking for here, very forecasted. Like your your opponent will generally know exactly what what's going on. Right. To counter that, 
you end up having to play these really weird turns uh, where you're bluffing pummel, even though you have like random stuff in your arsenal, random stuff in your hand, right. and you, you tank on certain little spots to to push the bluff even further, and that's that's you the entire game. You're just sitting there constantly bluffing and bluffing and bluffing and bluffing. And the problem with that is you you also end up taking a little bit of extra damage for those bluffs, right. kind of send up. So that when you come in with like a spinal crush or a disable, they will overblock it, and that will give you a little bit more more time. Um, and that, that if you set up the, the CNC like the, the double pummels and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, I I did that in my final ninja matchup where I kept floating the two for the pummel. Mm -hmm. So I kept floating the two, kept floating, the, and the pummel was there, but I didn't yeah. use it because I'm like I I'm not going to get the value on this turn. I'm going to wait, and then he no blocked because he could take that hit. And then pummeled, yeah. he didn't have the defense reaction. So I was like, yeah. like you said, the patience. Old me, I pummeled that first time to get the damage through. Yeah. New me, I'm just waiting, waiting. All right, you just gave me the opening. I've been I've been ho holding that two every time. Now I'm going to send it through for the pummel. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And uh, there's a lot of interesting mind games that come into that as well. Um, and it also depends on what kind of rapport you have with your opponent as well. Um, sometimes it can get very easy to get into a little bit of a, a little bit of a trash talking situation. When, <laughs> when like, it's a, like, oh yeah, so, uh, it didn't happen last time, but it wasn't quite quite good enough value for me. So I'm just gonna float through this time, see what you do. It it is funny because when I play when I play with uh, my group, it's every time I float the two, it's like, are you gonna pummel me? Are you pummel me? How many you got floating? You're gonna pummel me. But yeah, Blake Blake ran his his Bravo that he made and. Um, ended up getting third with it. It was when we had a re that armory event. It was Ira beat me. I had Kano. He had Bravo, and I think there was a Dorinthia player or something that was fourth. So it was super diverse in our little armory event. But the same thing. It was in, in when we were practicing. Every time you had the t floating two, you had to worry about that pummel. Especially as a wizard player, I can't take that. I have to either be able to kill him if he's going to do that. Otherwise I just die. So it was, it was, it's good testing. And I got to taste my own medicine doing that. <laughs> so what, uh, for you guys, do you have any big horizons or big tournaments coming up pre Monarch? Um, I know you guys just got shut down here for this week. Um, which is kind of funny. Our state, we're down to like 500 cases a day. So we're loosening back up and opening thing back up. You guys get one case and you're shutting everything down. Yeah. Uh, it's very much been like that. It's been a little bit of yo yoing, but I guess the plus side of that is that everyone's uh, being keeping safe and we get to have like a very open community where we don't have to worry about anything because we know if something does happen, we're just going yep. and keeping it down. But um, at the moment, we're, we, uh, Car Mission didn't get any skirmish events. Um, so we will um, basically just be tripping around, going to all the other ones, hopefully, uh, that, that are going on here in New Zealand. Like there's a couple of uh, weekends where there's, there's two in the same city. So I'll be flying off to, to all those ones to, to go see, say hi to everybody, to, to hang out with the boys, as yep. it were. <laughs> uh, have a bit of a good time. So I'm definitely looking forward to that as of our big plans. It's very hard to plan any really large scale tournaments at the moment and especially in person um just with uh the the yo-yoing of the levels that are going up and down because you can't really risk having all that organization in place and it just uh falling to pieces right do you um at your skirmish events are you guys getting what 30 40 people i suppose or is it getting that high yeah so at the last one we got about uh so the one on saturday uh just, just gone by uh I think we had 50-something players oh, at, a, at a field skirmish. And that was sealed as well. And I know a lot of people dislike sealed and didn't turn up because it was sealed. <laughs> Did you guys do – and you, that was the WTR sealed, right? Yeah, correct. Yes. Okay, okay. Yeah, we do – at our locals, that when we're doing armories, we do a sealed event either before or after a blitz event now. So we're just doing double. So it's a couple hours from where I live. So it's nice to go down and get two tournaments and have fun. I have come to yeah. the realization I'm a horrible sealed player. Um, I did a force of will sealed tournament this past weekend. I went two and one, and I was ecstatic about going two and one in that. So I'm a two and two sealed player. I have come to that realization that's who i am mm -hmm. so so yeah. any advice to sealed players i'd love to uh, hear it yeah absolutely um really 
prioritize your your powerful generics and let them kind of decide the the course of your draft. Obviously, if you get a crippling crash or something like that, then all right, you're probably going to end up playing Bravo. But for the most part, like your your generics will really point you in a direction. Did you get a lot of drone brutality? Did you get a lot of razor reflex? Did you get a lot of pummels? Did you get a, a lot of defense reactions? Because if you end up with a more um, like passive sort of deck, like getting one or two drone brutalities and some premium defense reactions, you can often play what I like to call the pile, where Okay. you pick a class that has the, the most cards in it, you put everything into a pile, and you say, all right, I'm going to play a fatigue deck, and we're just going to sit here and bang on you with my weapon a bunch. Because the, the card quality in, in Limited is... very limited so Yes, yes. uh, being able to, to block attacks with even like block twos um and being able to fully block out turns and if you have that higher quantity of cards there's only so long that they can spend the card blocking your weapon every turn or um, if you're in the case of bravo or reinhardt you'll be getting chip damage even when they are blocking Right. Inter yeah, so that 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 I think that is one thing I did the last one is I did boost the amount of cards that I have up and I did go Dorinthia, but I think it's another thing is I tried Ninja the first time that I did sealed and I played it the first three rounds and then I completely switched to Warrior for round four just for the hell of it because I'm like, I think I can win with it and I did. But I think Bravo is almost more comfortable for me and I don't know if that... If you go with a comfortable one or if you just stick with what you said, just get your best ones, whatever they suit with, you throw them together and, and go. Yeah. Yeah, because you can kind of mix and match the play styles with a lot of the classes as well, because you're playing so many of those generic attacks, it's very easy to play different styles of deck and limited. Right. Um, uh, some styles are very hard to play. For instance, uh, Combo Ninja isn't a thing that comes together very often, just due to the nature of how combo works and how you have to have multiples of certain cards for it to be consistent. Um, but one of the, the ninja decks that's really good is uh, Ninja Control. If you get enough uh, blue and yellow uh, zero cost Yep. uh, two or three blocks, you can build a deck that just goes very easily, like block with two cards. I'm just going to go like pitch Kadachi, hit you with a random generic seven power attack, or just pitch Kadachi, Kadachi, snatch, Yep. or something like that. Uh, that, that deck puts on a lot of pressure that way because it just ends up with so much bleed damage Yep. um, with so much chip that not a lot of the other decks can put out. Uh, the, the other deck in the point that's really good, obviously just generic Bravo. Bravo is very scary and limited because you can't really drop below that, that five, six life threshold Right. unless you're going in for lethal because often case they'll have like a Goliath gauntlet and a heart and cross trap and it's very easy for them to to push through with like a slogism or even just like the, the generic red line guardian cards hit for seven, eight, nine by themselves. Right. Uh, that dominated, you're blocking three, You're probably taking five to six damage. Um, so you really need to make sure that when you're you're getting hit below that point that you can actually come in for lethal there. And Reinar seems just kind of, uh, without in sealed, almost absolutely horrible because it's so hard to set up Reinar to do what he wants to do that his, his hero ability just isn't suited very well for sealed. I haven't even seen anybody run a Reinar in sealed yet. Yeah, actually, um, In some some limited pools, uh, Rhino can be very good, but it's extremely selective on the cards. You, you thought like, Combo Ninja was bad uh, for needing certain cards in order to work. Rhino is even worse. You need Stamp Dragon Scalers, first off. Yep. Um, you need Savage Feasts, um, and they, they make some, some really quality lines where you're, you're coming in with like, a Savage Feast for six, and you're pulling up the club for five off of one blue pitch, and you get the Arsenal, and you only spent three cards. That's Right. a lot of value. Yep. You can Yep. build those really high value and very explosive Rhino decks, but it really rewards you from having the the insane Rhino ball. So generally, the Rhino decks are either terrible or the pile deck that I was talking about before, where you just have a bunch of bunch of cards and you're just playing pile because your club costs two to swing with and it hits for four. It's Right, quite efficient. right. Or you end up with like the the insane like combo style brute deck. Okay. Yeah, I just, I have, I haven't seen it yet, but like I said, if you set it up properly, which I just think at our locals, we're not to the point to set up a brute and sealed quite to that level yet. Like the, the mind power isn't there. I would not, not playing it. I would never set it up to that, that ability. So just something I wouldn't do. So now I want to get um, some speculation from you. This is my, Sure. one of my favorite things to talk about, and that's Monarch. Um, Mm -hmm. I wish it was April 30th tomorrow. I wish it was even April. I'd take, I'd take April 6th right now. Give me April 6th, and I'll be happy just to see what the hell they're talking about. But 
I want to hear some speculation. Can be spot on, wild accusations. Let's let's hear what you have. All right, all right. Well, my this this is more hopes and dreams okay. than actual speculation <laughs> for what I believe that's that's going to happen. Um, but I hope that there's only going to be two new classes in Monarch, and I hope that they're going to pull some support for the previous classes rather than running the the four uh, new classes that they've done for the, the previous main sets. Um, and that's just to to give a, a bit of an easier jo- joining point for new players because if you look at twelve classes when you're starting, it's a very intimidating number. And there's a lot that you have to think about. I mean, even look at eight. There's a, there's a, there's a whole lot going on that they could do there. Um, now, going from the law book, actually, that I, that I, that I do have a copy of. Um, they they list all the the possible classes and more dot 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 yeah. on one of the pages. Um, and one of the ones I'm really hoping to see is alchemist. Um, I, yeah. I feel like an alchemist with a lot of potions and like a lot of kind of dot damage and a lot of like aura style effects that 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 happen when you do certain things you drink potion like x happens and y happens i i really enjoyed those very heavy setup decks and i think that would be something that's very very cool to see that we haven't really seen explored yet um as as to the the new dynamic third dimension of the game that we have yet to see that they're supposedly introducing with mona apparently the the game's not quite complete yet until the top has been released I have very little clue, uh, <laughs> no, no speculation. I'm just kind of sitting there in the corner just being like, I have no idea what these guys are talking about. Like, this game's already complicated enough. Are you really going to introduce, like, the fourth layer to this 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 three-dimensional object? Um, so, yeah. Uh, well, it's going to be wild. Whatever happens, I'm sure it's going to be a hell of a shake-up. Yeah, I, uh, it's funny because I always loved Wizards, like, movies growing up. So that's why I... I went to Kano and then Bravo just, you know, good looking guy with the ladies in the background. How can you not, uh, how can you not like him too? So that's, that's where I ended up picking when we started, but everybody has a different class. You're the first one to say alchemist. Um, I've heard assassin a lot, um, which I think is cool. I love in card games. I love graveyard recursion. So necromancer sounds pretty cool. To me, just because in any game, anytime you can stack your graveyard and pull things and have effects from your graveyard, I like because it adds that whole different dimension. Now, if somebody's trying to track your what you're pitching there, now they have to worry about your graveyard too. If there's possibilities more than just a remembrance to bring things back, if there's abilities in there, I think that's cool. It's probably a little further out. I don't think that'll probably happen in this set just because that would be a lot going on uh, early in a card game, but you never know. I, I'm just excited. I hope the light dark theme goes somewhere. Um, I've also, and I don't know why this is, I want a wizard with rune chants. I just think it would be amazing to throw a bunch of rune chants. And you're like, what the hell is this? I got to block these. Then I got to figure out how to block the rest. But then there's basically Shiana though, right? I push, suppose push yeah, that would, Shiana could do that, couldn't she? Yeah, yeah, this is very interesting. Actually, um, playing one Blitz event uh, a couple of months back, uh, I remember playing against Shiana and just being like, what the hell is going on? Are you getting Crippling Crush and there's Rune Chants coming at me? Like, Yeah, I've, I've tried Shiana just on TTS because I don't own the card. I, I am hoping that if it's not, obviously they said there's only one reprint and it's a crack bobble, but I hope they reprint her like they did um, the Tunic and Crucible where – they just have a cheat man's version so people like me can can play shiana because i think she's amazing i played tts and we did on live stream where i had three turns back to back where i went crippling alpha rampage alpha rampage it was the most amazing feeling ever that was my three turns in a row that you just can't do with any other character it felt awesome yeah absolutely yeah there's, there's definitely some some very special stuff going on with shiana and as time progresses and we see even more specialization cards as well. She'll get even spicier and spicier and spicier. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, because we, yeah, we should see some new, a lot of new specializations, especially if there's two new classes, which I'm 100% in agreement. I hope there is only two. I, I If they do four, oh, how are they going to put all that cards into – I mean, it's a huge set, 300 cards. If you think about any card pool, 305 cards, that's more than any game that I play for one yep. set so it's yeah, like it's, I sure. it usually i say a case is enough to fulfill my personal needs if this set 
because I always try to play one, but I have decks built. I'm sure you do, but I have I have a dash. I have my dash deck with my uh, dash aggro built for blitz. I have my Bravo deck. I have a um, Kano deck. I have a Dorinthia deck built. I have half ass Azalea built. So I love just having all the decks built because I enjoy the variety. Yeah. If they threw four more, that's a lot of money I got to spend to build four more decks because I'm going to want to play them at some point. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, I'm kind of in that spot as well because I have a, a cube, as, as it were, of seven of each card and, and non-foil. Unlimited. No, no, not alpha. <laughs> not, not that much. Um, but I got seven of each card. Um, that way I can have one classic constructed deck and two blitz decks with the, the, the same card pool. Uh, which is which is really cool, and then I can just kind of interchange and swap it out, and it's all sorted by class and alphabetically, so it's really easy just to make quick, nice, concise changes to it. Um, and I'm I'm kind of scared for my wallet to come on because I haven't really been able to secure uh, secure that much, and the prices just keep going up, and I'm I'm sitting here just like oh I'm probably gonna have to buy like ten cases or something in order to to complete my set of uh, of seven of each at this stage. That that's gonna be tough. I know I personally. I have one case for first edition ordered, and then I ha- I went with the Team Covenant cheap unlimited boxes because then I can just fill out the sets and play the game, which yeah. our group always been about the game. That's what yeah. we focus on. We, we're so excited that we can talk meta pretty much on a daily basis because it's ever-changing. Now that there's mm-hmm. – instead of just – five, 10 tournaments happen in a month. We got five, 10 a week happening and the meta is ever evolving. And to us, that is just the greatest feeling to talk about the ever changing meta. So I don't know about you, but that's, I love that. That's, that's why I love yeah, card me, games. Me, me too. I like, it's, it's just so fresh. Um, and like, you, you just see so much constant innovation as well. And it's very interesting that the, 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 the little, little, uh, niggly little changes that people make to decks can, can really change the whole idea. Um, and then just, just seeing that on a constant basis is, is super cool. Like, I, I never really experienced that with any other card game. Right. And then do you, have you, did you, have you written some articles and done some, some, any, any YouTube stuff, uh, previously? Uh, I've written a few articles for a few niche websites back, uh, uh probably was it Arcane Rising, uh, <laughs> sort of, sort of meta days where I made like a, uh, was a, a deck tech on like a pummel rune blade deck that I made in classic constructed that was really cool. It was based around setting up these big like fifteen card turns where you'd go like tome into tome into tome into tome and then do like five different things and then put three pummels on something. It was it was crazy. I loved right. that deck. Yeah. Uh, but but barring that, not really. No, I, I did a couple of articles. Um, I think it was on was it Fab DB. Okay. Uh, or for like some some playstyle stuff, but not really. No. That's cool because Fab, I love Fab DB. That was I became a Patreon immediately because if there's something I'm gonna pay for, it's gonna be people developing a site that makes my life easier. So yeah. the fact that they started that for free was amazing. Yeah, and I think that'll grow as it goes. So if you ever want to do a deck tech on our channel, let us know. We'd love to have you on and 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 see what you're brewing because I I talked to you after the Red Riot tournament and you told me about your the CNC pummel this tournament i kind of made my own bravo i did look at yours your previous deck i looked at kale's previous deck i tried to find a play style that kind of fit fit me between the two i ended up pulling the cncs and trying the chain of em- chain of eminence for the dash specifically for dash and never saw it so it was kind yeah. of a wasted card because you don't need it really against dorinthia you don't really need it against ninja and that's all i face so didn't really need that card, but I do like the CNC and I'm, uh, I'll probably try that out locally here once we get constructed going just to throw that out there because we have a lot of Dorinthia players, which I think they're going to hate that because they want to protect their arsenal as well, because that's where they put their huge turns and just to destroy their turn is amazing feeling. Really interesting that I do in the Dorinthia matchup is I actually cut down to one red and one blue pummel. So I only play the, the, the two pummels versus Dorinthia. Um, because you... it's a very dynamic card, yep. but multiples, it's very, very punishing. So often what you end up doing is you will end up bluffing a defense reaction after all yep. when you've drawn a one pummel. And you've seen them probably already once or twice already this game, and they, they haven't seen any pummels from you. So they're very likely just to block six and just not care um, on the CNC, and it's very easy to blow them out. Ironically, by playing less pummels, it's more than, powerful. Than, yeah, it's more powerful, right? 
So then do you just throw and, in, do you throw in some more immovables in, in place of those pummels? Yeah. So uh, the defense reaction suite that we ended up, that I ended up playing in my list, I believe, was uh, three red staunch response, three red fate, three red sink, um, the three blue unmovables, um, and just just leaving it as that. And then do you know red unmovables for you? No. Uh, so I put, I prefer red staunch over red unmovable, uh, just because I never really like to pitch them anyway. Um, and the the ability to block ten on one card is amazing. Is, is very, big um and and the Dorinthia matchup um blocking eight is actually kind of an awkward number and a lot of Dorinthia scenarios because often what will end up happening uh if you go three plus three and then a singing plus three is ten so like, generally on the the best sort of best case scenario turns for them uh the the red staunch will completely cover you yep. um and you're not burning any additional cards whereas you're blocking eight off one card with unmovable from arsenal um so you're getting that two bit of extra block though so it's like having your extra card there and getting plus one card in your deck yep. um and often those matchups can come up where those three extra cards from your double pitch chance responses will actually end up winning you the game because you you ended up being able to grind out your opponent and you get those two or three extra cards to be able to block with or swing your hand with etc right right and those are the ones that if you put in there when the, they pull the cnc is the, the one you absolutely protect <laughs> that that yeah. arsenal <laughs> but yeah i agree so one last thing before i let you go so our buddy mark plays a lot of reinar and he does very good with him mm-hmm. how does he beat ira with reinar let me know ira for mark with, is he playing for uh, blitz. Like the, yep the obviously for blitz <laughs> yeah uh, it, uh, what kind of reinar build is it is it the like Combo like bellow claws deck, or he he wants to try the claws with the bellows, which is a lot of setup. Do you think there's a better version against Ira? Because Ira's right it's now, the, Ira's pretty good in the area. Yeah, it's 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 just very generically strong. The way to beat Ira generally is to not play their game plan. Their game plan is to block two to three cards and come back to you for one, two, or three cards, and then just kind of play that value back and forth game. The way you beat that is generally by blocking your whole hand, doing nothing, and setting up these really big turns with uh, playing stuff like energy potions. Um, and then just as soon as you're drawing that, that bellow, you stick it in an arsenal. Yep. You use your equipment to, to block their CNC or to, to block their, their second attack, turn off their mask, um, and then you, you go in like that, and then you can have your 15, 16, 17, 20 damage turn, and then you wait for your second one, do it all over again. <laughs> um that's how the game plan tends to work out and it's pretty good the only the only times that deck generally loses in that matchup is when they draw the bellow too late and they bleed too much damage over the start of the game so it, it's a very draw dependent matchup in that sense um but if you can if you can not get the the two bellows in the last five cards of your deck you, you should generally be all right very good yeah i that's a deck that when we all started and we've told everybody that's new to the game get a group of friends buy a box, everybody pick a class, hopefully you like that class, and split your cards. That's exactly what we did. Uh, it just turned out that everybody was happy with their class. Mark took Reinar, Dane took uh, Katsu, Blake took Tarinthia, and I took Bravo, and we legitimately just, everybody got those cards. And it worked out great, because then you had a great deck. But Reinar is fun to play. After playing him in, on TTS a lot, He's a very enjoyable class to play, so I'm a little upset. He's one of the only ones I don't have built, and it's like, well, <laughs> once this next wave unlimited, I might have to start putting him together on the side. Yeah, yeah. Because he is fun. So I appreciate you very much for coming on with me tonight and just going over it. And uh, like I said, open invitation if you ever want to hop on our Tuesday night live streams and ultimate pit fight or you know whack us around with any one of your decks – uh, let me know. Feel free. Sure. Sounds, sounds good, buddy. Uh, thanks. Thanks for having me. It's been really enjoyable just having a chat and a bit of a yarn about the, the state of the, all things fair. <laughs> yes. We love the game. Thank you. Yeah. No worries. See you later.